First, I want to give an acknowledgement. UCLA acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tabanga and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the indigenous people in this place. As a land grant institution, we pay respects to our ancestors, our elders, and our relatives past, present, and emerging. So I'm Roger Wakimoto. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Creative Activities and I want to welcome you all to the 134th Faculty Research Lecture. And I'm really happy to say that this is the first in-person lecture since we shut down from the pandemic. So it's been literally three years, so I'm very happy uh, to be here. A oh, brief reminder, besides the, what you heard before I came up here, this is being recorded uh, because it will be posted on our website later on. Uh, just briefly, the faculty research lecture is in recognition of research excellence and is the highest recognition bestowed upon a person's faculty peers. The lecture provides a platform to share their scholarship with a broader community. And so thank you very much for showing up. So with that, I'll, let's go right into the program. I want to introduce our executive vice chancellor and provost, Darnell Hunt. He's going to introduce the speaker. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Wakimoto, and thank you to the Office of Research and Creative Activities for hosting our 134th uh, Faculty Research Lecture. So I'm grateful, as uh, Vice Chancellor Wakimoto mentioned, to be able to gather here in person for the first time since the pandemic. The uh, Faculty Research Lecture represents one of UCLA's most esteemed academic honors as well as a public forum for the presentation of some of the most remarkable research conducted at our university. Now, while today's lecture highlights one scholar and his innovative studies, this series also honors all of UCLA's researchers and the work they do. The faculty research lecture is a testament to the importance of academic research writ large, whether that is applied research that aims to solve a practical problem, or basic inquiry that pushes the limits of human knowledge and may lead to striking developments down the line. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's lecturer, Professor of Physiology and Neurobiology, Baljeet Kark. Professor Kark trained at Cambridge, Bristol, and Caltech, and has been a professor here at UCLA for 17 years. In his work, Professor Kark has uncovered fundamental new mechanisms by which astrocytes uh, overlooked star-like cells regulate brain function and disease. It is this paradigm-defining work that he will share with us today. Now, during his time at UCLA, Professor Clark has won numerous awards for his work on astrocytes in the brain. These include the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, the Outstanding Investigator Award from the NIH National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and the Allen Institute Distinguished Investigator Award, just to name a few. In addition to his research, Professor Clark started and co-directs a high school outreach program aimed at Los Angeles' underserved communities. For more than 15 years, this program has provided high school students with their first thrill of scientific discovery. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Baljeet Clark. Um, good afternoon, um, hello, and welcome. Um, it's a real privilege to be here, and thank you all for coming along to listen. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Vice Chancellor Wakimoto and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Hunt for the generous and uh, kind introduction. Also, Melissa for organizing uh, this event and her staff, and the selection committee that uh, chose me for the honor of giving the 134th lecture. I also want to give a shout out to Professor Tom O'Dell, who nominated me for this recognition. Um, this is a special um, sort of thing for me because most of you will not know that Tom was the uh, chair of the committee that recruited me 18 years ago. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real sort of, um, it's personal to me that he nominated me for this. And over the course of the last 18 years, he's become one of my most trusted colleagues and also um, one of my mentors. So thank you, Tom. So what I want to do for the next 45 to 50 minutes 
is to take you on a journey about what we've been doing for the last 13 years. I'm going to tell you that we've been working on a cell type in the brain called astrocytes, which historically were named because of their misleading star-like shapes. And I'm going to tell you that after a slow start, these cells are finally beginning to reveal their secrets. I'll start off by telling you why we started to work on these cells, what we've been doing in the last 15, 13 years or so, what we found so far, and why we think this is relevant for how the brain works, both phys in physiology and in disease. Okay, but before I do that, I want to give a quick shout out to some of the people, um, the members of my lab who've contributed to its success, especially the people with STARS, whose work I'll mention today. Also my collaborators, most of whom are from UCLA, especially the people with STARS, who, with whom I've collaborated for um, many years the physiology admin staff for making sure I get my progress reports submitted on time, and all of the various agencies that have supported my lab, especially the NIH, CHDI, and the Resler Family Foundation. Okay, with that, let's get started. So I think by way of introduction, it'll be very clear, and you'll be all appreciative of the fact that a major goal of biology is to understand the human brain. Now, the reasons for this will be obvious to all of you because all of the things that define us as individuals and perhaps even define us as humans, such as things like our thoughts, our memories, our emotions, cognition and perceptions, all reside in the brain. However, for thousands of years, philosophers and early scientists thought that the seat of the soul was in fact in the heart and the brain was nothing more than an elaborate cooling device that was designed to cool the blood, various bodily fluids and other humors. So with that as a backdrop, arguably our mechanistic understanding of the brain really only started about 360 years ago. In the 1660s, Robert Hooke, using very early microscopes, discovered simply and famously by studying cork that cells were a fundamental building block of life. This led to the cell theory, which dictated all forms of life on Earth were composed of repeating units of cells. Now, these days we take this idea for granted, but you have to cast your mind back to what it must have been like for Robert Hooke and early uh, pioneers to discover that cells were the essential building blocks of life. You might even say that moment was electrifying, but Robert Hooke would have no idea what electrifying meant because it would be another 220 years before electricity became widely used. So Robert Hooke made these foundational discoveries with nothing more than sunlight, candlelight, primitive microscopes, and great intuition. Then followed 200 years of people poking around the brain, chopping it up into small pieces, trying to understand how it works. However, the brain proved particularly difficult to study at a cellular level, and the next major advance came in the 1870s when Golgi discovered and invented this method called the silver chromate staining method. And what this did is it labeled small numbers of neurons densely black against an otherwise uninteresting background. And then within a year of mastering that method, Cajal in 1888 started to publish an avalanche of papers where he documented the cells of the brain in great detail from multiple brain regions and across different species. And this gave rise to the doctrine or the neuronal doctrine which dictates the secret to understanding the brain are its individual cells and their connections, which occur at small gaps, which later became known as synapses. Now, the neural doctrine is certainly true. And now, right now, there are thousands of people around the world studying the neural doctrine in their own very specialized and intricate ways. However, both Kahal and Golgi were remarkably open-minded and perhaps forward-thinking, because in addition to drawing neurons such as this one, they drew hundreds, if not thousands, of additional cells in the brain, which are called glia. These glial cells sit on top of neurons and in between them. So here I'm going to show you an example of some of the early drawings by Golgi. And you can see there's a cell here. And radiating out from this are a series of processes that give it this rather star-like shape. Here's another example with some processes that are contacting these tubular structures, which are blood vessels. And here's an example of a drawing by Cajal. And you, again, you can see a radial, radially emanating processes that give rise to these uh, morphological forms. 
And because of these shapes, early neuroanatomists simply called those cells star-like cells. But in 1895, Michael von Lenhusek realized that these were a distinct type of cell, separate from other cells in the brain, and called them astrocytes. And then in 1919, Rio Hotega, who was Cajal's PhD student, discovered two additional populations of cell called oligodendrocytes and microglia. So by 1919, it was already clear that the brain comprised four major cell types. Neurons, which we now know to be diverse themselves, astrocytes, the topic of today's discussion, oligodendrocytes, and microglia. However, it's fair to say that in relation to other cells in the body and in relation to neurons, our understanding of these cells has lagged behind. And this fundamental gap in un our understanding of how the brain works is itself not new, because Cajal himself lamented in 1904, what is the function of glial cells in neural centers? The answer is still not known, and the problem is even more serious because it may remain unsolved for many years to come until physiologists find direct methods to attack it. Arguably, this statement was as true 20 years ago as it was in 1904, but in the last 20 years or so, the stars really have aligned, and there has been progress, and these cells are finally beginning to tell us what their mysteries are within the nervous system. And that's what I want to discuss today. But before I do that, I think it's informative and instructive to ask ourselves why is it that studies of these cells were so slow? And what does that tell us about the underlying biology? And I'd like to give you three reasons for this. The first of those reasons is illustrated here. What this slide shows is a neuron and an astrocyte. Both of these are from the striatum. And if you were to record from a neuron and measure its membrane properties, you would be able to measure these electrical signals that we call action potentials, the basic information processing units of, um, of the nervous system. But if you were to do a similar experiment from an astrocyte, you could measure no electrical signals of a similar nature. And this is because these cells are electrically silent. So much of what we understand about the nervous system has been dictated by electrophysiology that over the last 50 or 60 years, when electrophysiologists and neuroscientists recorded from these cells and realized they were silent, they simply dismissed them as rather mundane and boring cells not worthy of attention. Later, I'll show you that far from being silent, these cells are very active, but their activity is not electrical, it's intracellular and chemical. The second reason that study of these cells has lagged behind is illustrated in this movie. What this shows you is a section of a mouse's brain in this plane, roughly, and here every astrocyte has been labeled green. And you can see, if you zoom into the hippocampus, they exist everywhere. And if you now zoom out and zoom back into another part of the brain in the cortex, you can see that they look essentially the same. And this led to the rather dogmatic belief that these cells were some sort of homogenous and ubiquitous morass of cells that were otherwise uninteresting and simply existed everywhere. Later, I'll show you data which shows that that is also incorrect and that these cells have very many region-specific properties. The third reason the study of these cells has lagged behind is illustrated here. What this shows you are two reconstructions of astrocytes, and you can appreciate that far from being star-like, these cells are remarkably complex. And this complexity, how it arises, how it forms, and what it does, even now, is largely unknown. So, in my lab, we're driven by simple ideas, and one concept that drives us is that in biology, form and structure always reflect function. Now, this is certainly true at the level of molecules. For example, base pairing in DNA immediately suggests a mechanism of DNA replication. It's certainly true at the level of species, for example, in social hierarchy. And it must also be true at the level of cells, such as these. And the fact that we can see these cells simply if we look with the right methods really implores us to understand how this complexity arises, what this complexity does, and what it's good and what it's bad for. But if you were to look at one of these cells for yourself down the microscope and see this beautiful structure, I'm convinced that all of you too will wonder what these cells do. 
once you see one in real time, in real life, down the microscope, you can't unsee it. And that's the beauty of being, do, be, being able to do the experiments yourself. So when I started thinking about this, I set ourselves three goals to unmask the biology of these cells. The first of those was to develop the methods to study them, because I've said to you that the methods of neurophysiology were not adequate to study these cells. The second was to start using those methods to understand what these cells do in the nervous system. And the third, and the third was to exploit that to try and understand what happens in disease. I'm gonna to touch on all of these things, but mainly focus on the last two. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the tools we've made. The tools we've made are divided into four categories, genetic tools. Here we've made tools to be able to manipulate the cells selectively and on demand, to be able to turn them on, to be able to turn them off, and to be able to target them with selectivity and not affect other cells. Sensors, we've developed sensors to see how they are relative to another cell type to be able to image signaling events within them and between them so we can measure ongoing physiological events. We've determined their molecular profiles, the genes they express, the proteins they have, how abundant they are and where they are. And we've developed computational methods to analyze these data, especially the imaging data, and we've developed Hodgkin-Huxley models of neurons to be able to determine how astrocytes affect neurons. Now, to give you an example of the take-up of these uh, tools, our tools in categories one and two in the last few years have been requested by 4,000 researchers around the world, which is a very large number considering how small the field is. And everybody sensible is now using our mice and our viruses to study these cells. There's an additional, more subtle point I'd like to make. A good friend of mine, Lauren Luger, who himself is an accomplished uh, tool generator, a few years ago said to me that if your only tool is a hammer, then eventually everything starts to look like a nail. And I think that's an insightful point because these tools don't just allow you to do one thing. Having a set of tools allows you to go after new questions in completely new ways and ask questions that you couldn't previously think of. It's no surprise that every major breakthrough in neuroscience and perhaps in biology has come on the heels of a new tool, a new technique, or a new approach that have allowed us to see better and measure better. So I've mentioned the tools we've used. Let me tell you about the part of the brain that we've been studying. We've been studying a part of the brain called the striatum. It's a subcortical nucleus, part of a larger circuit in the brain called the basal ganglia. This is a very important circuit and we use it all of the time. It's important for things like movement, selection of actions, motor functions, and it's intimately involved in a whole host of diseases, including Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, repetitive behaviors, OCD, addiction, and some quite bizarre things, such as habits, rituals, and tics. I decided to study this area because if we could study what astrocytes do here, then there was real relevance to the real world. If you now zoom in to a small area of the striatum, and here all of the astrocytes have been labeled in yellow, green, and red, and you can see them at a higher magnification here, they begin to appear like autumn leaves on the garden floor, completely decorating the striatum. I'm sure you can appreciate these are remarkably beautiful cells. If you zoom in even further, they begin to reveal their full glory. For example, here you can see one astrocyte with the cell body, some branches, and thousands of smaller structures that we call branchlets and leaflets. These cells, far from being star-like, are, are much more complex. Remarkably, these cells tile the entire brain. And what that means is that when one cell stops, another one starts, and they never encroach onto each other's territories. And the molecular basis of this morphology and of this tiling even today is completely unknown. If you were to zoom in even further to one of these small structures with a different method, here electron microscopy, you would be able to identify elementary units of information processing in the nervous system called synapses, indicated here in pink and green. And invariably you would find that 60% or more of these synapses would be contacted 
by a very fine process that we call a leaflet from one of these astrocytes, indicated in yellow here. And in this way, because of the anatomy, throughout the brain, astrocytes intimately contact neurons and synapses. So with that, I've given you a sort of introduction to what the cells look like and that they exist everywhere. And what I want to do now is to tell you about what we've been doing with them. And I'm going to break this down into four segments. Identity, form, function, and disease. So let's start with identity. What do I mean by this? So to illustrate this, I'm going to show you this movie of the striatum and the hippocampus where two parts of the brain, where all the astrocytes are labeled in green. And you can just see that they exist at high density, but otherwise, they look basically the same. By looking at them, you can't tell that there's any difference. And this has led to the dogmatic belief that there is sort of ubiquitous glue. So I found that explanation sort of unsatisfactory, and a few years ago, we designed an experiment to directly test it. What we did was we took the astrocytes from these two regions and we subjected them to a range of experimental evaluations, including electrophysiology, imaging things of relevance, studying their morphology, and looking at their molecular expression of genes and proteins. And then we thought if we did this agnostically, at scale, then we would be able to use our intuition and bioinformatics to be able to answer the question about whether these cells are the same or not. And what we found was that there were very many significant differences between these cells, between these two brain regions. So we already knew that the neurons between brain regions were different. The underpinnings of this go all the way back to Cajal. And what our data show is that the astrocytes are also different between circuits. Now, of course, the brain doesn't exist simply of two areas. There are very many brain areas uh, in the nervous system. And those are illustrated in this movie. Here, every astrocyte has been labeled in red. And as we take a deep dive into this brain, you'll be able to see that these spots, these dots, the cell bodies of these cells exist everywhere in the brain. In the mouse brain, there are probably 20 million astrocytes. And in the human, perhaps about 20 billion, although the numbers are hard to come by. And so the question became, oh, OK. Uh, so the question became, what about other brain areas? And so it took us five years to design an experiment to be able to test this. And what we did was we decided to measure the structure of these cells in multiple brain regions, morphology. And then we also decided to measure their molecular signatures. What are the molecules and the genes that these cells express? And we thought if we had both of these sets of data, we'd be able to compare them and determine how those genes were related to their morphology and perhaps we could shed some light onto what they do in disease. So this is a huge data set, and I want to summarize it by giving you just a couple of take-home messages. The first is, we documented astrocytes throughout the mouse's brain, and we found that they differ between different regions. Their structure differs between different regions, their morphology, and their molecular makeup, the genes that they express, also differs. So when I say this to people, invariably they ask, well, if they differ, how do we know that they're the same cell type? And so to address this, I'd make, like to make a simple analogy to Darwin's finches and the Galapagos Islands. Here on the Galapagos Islands, these finches all underwent adaptive radiation to fit environmental niches. That adaptive radiation is represented in their genes, but it's also represented in the, in the morphology and the structure of their beaks. However, they are still all finches. In the same way, these astrocytes have undergone regional adaptation to suit the needs of the local tissue, and that regional adaptation is reflected in their morphology and also in the genes that they express, but they are still all astrocytes. Furthermore, we haven't got just three areas, we've got very many areas, and by having very many areas, we can do some interesting things with the data. For example, we can ask, what can we learn about this morphology? Now, these cells are morphologically complex, so there isn't a simple thing you can measure from their morphology, such as their length. So we measured their morphology in 10 different ways. And then we related that morphology 
to the genes that they expressed and asked which are the sets of genes associated with complex structural forms. And from that analysis, we identified sets of genes or modules of genes that were predictive or correlated with these complex forms. And we tested that idea by knocking some of these genes out and showed causation. And what this suggests for the first time, I believe, is the molecular basis of how these complex shapes arise. Now, to me personally, this is actually very exciting because the early anatomists drew these cells because of their morphology. And 140 years later, I think we're beginning to understand why those shapes arise, and that's in, within, these, with the, within these genes. However, it gets even more interesting when you consider disease. Here is a drawing made by uh, Alzheimer in 1911, and what this drawing illustrates is that glial cells, including astrocytes, undergo shape changes in Alzheimer's disease relative to control humans. They change their shape, they become thicker, their processes become thicker. And this has been well known. Virchow in 1858 noted that this very interstitial tissue of the brain and spinal marrow is one of the most frequent seats of morbid change. And then Maynard in 1873 noted, these cells swell up under certain pathological conditions and assume, assume grotesque forms. So implicit in these descriptions is the idea that these cells change shape in disease. So we wondered, what about the genes that we identified that cause their morphological shapes in the first place? How do they change in disease? And so we compared our data to data from multiple diseases, including multiple sclerosis, OCD, Alzheimer's disease, and ALS. And we found that for several of these diseases, the genes that we determined were controlling the morphology were also enriched within the disease-associated signatures of these disorders. So it's worth thinking about what that means. What that means is that even though these diseases all arise for distinct molecular reasons and have distinct uh, uh, clinical presentations, it's possible that the underlying change that happens in astrocytes is actually quite conserved. And if that were the case, what that suggests is that is if you could fix that change, you may be able to produce benefit across multiple disorders. Now that sounds a little bit magical, I know, right? But I think it's an idea worth considering, and I think it has merit. And anyway, all good ideas should sound magical until they've been proven or refuted. And we're now trying to prove or refute this one. So in the first part, I've told you that scientists thought that these cells were a homogenous morass, a forest of cells that were essentially the same. In fact, our data show that's wrong, that these cells are very diverse and they have region-specific properties and they have diversity within brain regions. And the relevance of this is something that we're exploring now. The second topic I want to tell you about is what I call the form of these cells. And let me illustrate what I mean by that. If these cells are complex, then it's been widely assumed that this complexity is useful for something and mediates physiological responses in the cell body, in their branches, in their branchlets, and the finest structures or the leaflets. But the truth is, we don't know how any of that happens. And so we simply asked, what is within these compartments? In order to do this, we used a method where we express a small enzyme. The details here don't matter that much. But what this enzyme does, it adds a small molecule called a biotin. You can think of this as a flag. And it flags nearby proteins so they get labeled. And once that protein is labeled with that flag, you can use that flag to identify it and then subsequently uh, study it. Now the beauty of this method is that the only proteins that get flagged are the ones which are close by. So in this case, these proteins on the cell's membrane don't get flagged. And what that suggests is that if you can target this to the plasma membrane, you would tag only the proteins at the plasma membrane. And if you think of this even more, this means if you could address this enzyme to any bit of the cell you wanted, you would capture the proteins from that bit of the cell. And that's exactly what we did. Does this method work? Here's an example of a cross section, a coronal section of a mouse's brain, showing that the enzyme is expressed within the striatum. And what this shows you in green are all of those proteins that were labeled, the flag proteins in green. 
And I hope you can see that these two areas overlap. And that was our first clue that was, this was working. If you now zoom in to that area with greater magnification, you can begin to see in the green image all of these beautiful structures, including those complex cells and the blood vessels that they contact. As soon as I saw this, I knew this was going to work. It was just a case of doing it now, but this is going to work. And because the right interpretation of this image is that every single green pixel in this image represents hundreds, if not thousands of proteins, and all we have to do is to systematically identify them. And so that's what we did, but we did it on steroids. And what do I mean by that? We thought, well, if we're gonna do this, let's do it for everything that's interesting. So we targeted the bit of the cell that contacts blood vessels, and we have a genetic strategy to do that. We targeted the cell's major branches. We have a genetic strategy to do that. We targeted the bit of the cell that contacts synapses, and we have a genetic strategy for that. And then the sites at which these cells maintain the extracellular environment by soaking up ions, we did that. And then also, remember I showed you that they tile, they contact each other at their edges. We targeted the sites of cell-cell contact. And when we did this, we identified the proteins from all of these regions that I've illustrated. And this is a summary of a very, very large data set. And this is called a clustergram. And what this shows you are the unique proteins in each of those areas, those compartments that I've mentioned. Overall, we identified about 3,000 proteins, several hundred novel proteins about which we know very little or nothing at all within these cells. 30% of the proteins were identified were enriched only in compartments, which speaks to the idea of their complex morphology mediating distributed physiology. For example, the bits of the cell that contact blood vessels have 247 unique proteins, and the bits of the astrocyte that contact synapses have 205. So this is a huge data set. Not only the proteins, we have the genes as well. And so we wondered what would be the best way to summarize these data to represent them in a way that's digestible and useful for people in the field. And so, like every good Indian, when faced with a seemingly insurmountable problem, I looked high and low for a solution and eventually turned to cricket. And so, in cricket, we know you can represent the statistics of a cricket player in a very handy way called a cricket card. The entire career can be summarized in one card. And so we took inspiration from this and made astrocyte cards. So for example, this card shows you the compartment. It shows you all the proteins. It shows you the relationship with genes. It gives you validation, quantitative validation, with high-resolution imaging. It tells you the proteins that it interacts with and the functions served by that compartment. And we've expanded this to multiple other compartments. And we hope that these, these cards will allow people to share them, to refine them, to improve them, and would focus minds to go after the key physiological responses. We plan to expand these cards for other compartments until we've crushed every meaningful compartment of these cells and understood it. So this, I believe, is also exciting. And the reason it's exciting is because the physiology of these cells has been shrouded in mystery. But by understanding the proteins there, what we're essentially doing is revealing the molecular basis of distributed physiology in a highly complex cell, including in all of the compartments that I've been mentioning. And already, our list of proteins includes dozens of new receptors, channels, and transporters whose functions we don't yet understand. There's already enough data here to keep a small institute busy for several years. So I've told you about identity, and I've told you about form. Now I want to switch and tell you about function. And so the question here is, if astrocytes are sitting in between and on top of neurons and are intimately associated with them, do they actually communicate with them? Is there any communication between these two major cell types of the brain? These cells are not electrically excitable, but what we found several years ago was what I called at the time spotty intracellular calcium signals. By moving a calcium sensor, to the plasma membrane, we discovered 
these signals, which you can see here as flashes, these flashes are local, they're frequent, they're large amplitude, and they appear random. And so we thought that these spotty calcium signals may be a good substrate by which astrocytes and neurons communicate. This was in an isolated cells. It took us another two years to be able to do this in an intact preparation. And what this movie now shows you is what I then called a sparkling panorama of calcium signals. And this sparkling panorama of calcium signals in an intact brain was even richer. There were many thousands of signals that the field had completely missed because they had focused exclusively on the cell body. If you do this experiment with the right methods, you can see thousands of biochemical signals. Now, just because these signals exist, it doesn't mean they do anything. And so then we set our sights on asking, what do they do? And we've taken two approaches to this. The first is we silence them, we turn them off, and ask what happens to circuits and behavior. And the second is we turn some of them on and ask what happens to circuits and behavior. And so let me tell you about that work in the next few minutes. So I won't go into the details of how we did this. I'm happy to answer any questions on that later. But it took us several years to develop a genetic method to broadly silence, to turn these signals down. And to illustrate how this works, this upper panel shows you in color now several cells which had those flashes. And you can see there are very many. And now you can see what happens when you silence these signals or attenuate them. Most of those signals go away, and they're silenced by about 90%. Because we can silence them by 90%, we can now ask what happens to circuits and to behavior within the striatum. And what we found was that when you silence these signals, the mice that in which you've silenced them start to display new behaviors. And the new behavior that they display is called excessive self-grooming. This is an innate behavior in the mice and is used as a model for the compulsion aspects of OCD-like phenotypes. And we went on to show that the reason this happens is because silencing the calcium signals leads to changes in the neuronal circuits within the striatum that change this behavior, that drive this behavior. And so by silencing them, we discovered that these signals weren't just happening, that they had real consequential effects on circuits and behavior. The next strategy that we've used is to turn on specific signals and ask what happens. And in order to be able to turn on specific signals, we had to first identify what we should turn on. And the way we did this was to ask, how do neurons communicate with astrocytes? And we found that in the striatum, during a specific type of response called an upstate, these neurons release GABA. This is a neurotransmitter in the brain. This neurotransmitter activates a receptor on astrocytes and that receptor causes some of those calcium signals that I've been showing you. Because we knew what this receptor was, we could then go in in vivo and mimic it and activate it when we wanted on demand and ask what happens and do that selectively only in astrocytes. And when we did that, what we found was that these mice displayed another behavior. This behavior we characterized as hyperactive with disrupted attention. It's very synonymous with ADHD-like behavior. And the reason this happens is that when you activate this signal, what you do within the astrocytes is you activate a latent cue that the cells used early on in development. And if you turn this on in the adult, then you activate that latent cue. You can strengthen synapses. Synapses get strength stronger, and you get more action potential firing within the neurons. And that gives rise to this ADHD-like behavior. So in the function aspect, what I've been telling you is that we discovered this sparkling panorama of calcium signals, which although not a form of electrical excitability, is a form of signaling within the cells. We set about trying to understand whether that signal was causal for anything. Did it actually do anything useful? And by silencing it on the one hand and activating specific forms of it on the other, these data, I believe, provide strong evidence that the sparkling panorama of signals is actually being used. It's instructive for the neurons nearby, and that instruction, that instructiveness towards neurons is ultimately behaviorally consequential. And I think that idea has 
relevant for our broader understanding of how neural circuits and how the nervous system works more broadly. So I've told you about identity, I've told you about form, and I've told you a little bit about function. Now I want to switch and tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing in the area of disease. We've decided to focus several years ago on Huntington's disease. So I need to give you a brief introduction about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a degenerative disorder. It affects large parts of the brain, but the striatum, the part of the brain that we've been studying, is particularly vulnerable. Typically, it has an age of onset of about 45 years, which is preceded by about 15 years of a prodromal phase. Then after a neurologist diagnoses the patient, there's the manifest phase of about 18 years, and everybody who has Huntington's disease ultimately dies from it. It's a truly terrible disease. It has sort of three types of symptoms, cognitive, psychiatric, and motor. And how bad this disease, I think, is really illustrated by these two photographs of the same person 13 years apart. It really destroys large parts of the brain and ultimately large parts of the body. Not only is there a great clinical need to understand this disease, this disease is also extremely interesting mechanistically. As opposed to other degenerative diseases like multiple sclerosis, ALS, or Alzheimer's, which for most cases we don't know how they arise, in Huntington's disease, there's only one known cause. There's only one way you can get this disease, and that's due to a mutant protein called mutant HTT. There's a lot of information associated with this slide, so I'm just going to make a couple of general points. What happens is, is that in the gene of, this, of the HTT gene, you can get mutant repeats that expand. And if you are um, a person who doesn't have the disease, the number of these repeats is less than 35, and you will go on to live a normal life and not get this disease. But if you have an expansion, or you inherit an expansion, and this number of these mutant repeats increases to 40 or more, you will go on to get this disease, and you will ultimately die from it. And so it's a disease that we know exactly what causes it. And we've known for about 30 years that this mutant protein exists not only in neurons, but also exists in astrocytes. And so we asked, if it exists in astrocytes, do astrocytes contribute to this disease? And early on, we found in a paper in 2014, we found that astrocytes were losing their ability to maintain the extracellular environment. And by losing their ability to maintain the extracellular environment, this was detrimental to the neurons. It took us another five years to address that more broadly. And what we did was we analyzed data from post-mortem HD brain samples and controls at multiple grades, mild, moderate, and severe, using their gene expression patterns. And then we compared those data to what happens in different kinds of models, mouse models of this disease. Again, at different ages, mild, moderate, and severe, and different models, so we could be sure that we were on the right track. And we did this at the level of genes, and we did this at the level of proteins. And what we found from this was that astrocytes changed substantially in these diseases, but it wasn't that they were acquiring a new function that was killing the neurons or somehow damaging the neurons. They were being detrimental to the neurons because they stopped doing all of the good things that they normally do. And so they were losing their essential functions in the brain, and the loss of those essential functions was detrimental. So if you think about that, that immediately suggests, well, what if you could restore those essential functions? Might that be beneficial in the disorder? And so we thought, how could we do this? And the first clue to that was to compare the data from humans and mice and identify the genes that went down. And we managed to do that. There's a set of genes that go down. And then we asked, what can we do to try and reverse those changes in expression? The genes that go down, if we could turn them back on, maybe that would be beneficial. And we did a heroic set of experiments in the lab to try and find this. And in the end, we identified a pathway, a receptor pathway in these cells that to a large extent reversed those gene expression changes. This, if you like, is an upstream regulator of those genes. And if you activate it, this master upstream regulator 
And then you can reverse those changes. And then this led us to a hypothesis that maybe we could do this in the mouse model and produce benefit in the disease. And so it's a huge data set. I don't have time to go through all of it, but I just want to give you a couple of uh, sort of snippets of information. So what these waveforms here show you, and you don't really, really need to understand the waveforms, are what we call excitatory synaptic currents. It's a measurement of synaptic transmission onto these neurons. And in a normal situation, you can see that these waveforms have large amplitude. And it's been well known for many years that in Huntington's disease, these waveforms you can see get smaller. That's because synapses get weaker. And so when you activate this pathway within astrocytes, you can see that the green traces are now far bigger than this and getting close to this. And what this illustrates is that if you activate this pathway within astrocytes, you can restore some benefit to synapses in the mouse models. So we expanded this and then looked at other metrics, including signaling from astrocytes that I mentioned earlier, other aspects of synapses, and also mouse behavior. And what these experiments showed us is that if you activate this pathway in astrocytes, you can restore function across the board in several, but importantly, not in all aspects of this disease. And what that suggests to us is that is if you can mobilize this pathway, this may be clinically beneficial in humans, potentially. So to shed light into that, we looked at the molecular profile to try and understand what was going on in the cells. And on the basis of this, we've identified 23 novel receptors, which are in astrocytes, only in the striatum, don't change in the disease. And as far as I'm concerned, these 23 receptors are valid therapeutic targets to produce benefit in this disorder. So let me try and summarize that more broadly. Huntington's disease is a terrible disease. It's clearly a disease in which neurons are the major drivers. However, as with many of the diseases, it's not a neuronal disease. It's actually a multicellular disease. The mutant protein affects neurons, it affects astrocytes, it affects all other cells in the nervous system. And because it's a multicellular disease, our approach to tackling this disease must also be multimodal. What that means is we must identify the relevant targets in neurons, and we must identify the relevant targets in other cells. And only by targeting all critical targets are we likely to produce benefit. Targeting just the neuronal targets is not likely to work because those targets, by definition, exist in tissue, which itself is dysfunctional. This may explain why the last four decades of chasing neuronal targets has produced very few or no disease-modifying treatments for all of the major brain diseases. Our data suggest our best strategy to tackling these sorts of diseases is to start targeting them as, with multimodal therapeutics that hit at key different mechanisms. So to summarize what we've been up to and what I've been telling you, we've had many adventures in physiology in the last 13 years, ranging from the molecular to the cellular to brain regions to between brain regions and also all the way up to whole animals and with bearing to what happens in humans. I'd like to think we've made four contributions. The first is, I think it's fair to say, my lab was critical in the discovery that astrocytes are remarkably diverse between and within brain areas. At the level of form, we've identified their subproteomes, the proteins that exist within the cells, and this is beginning to reveal what I call the molecular basis of distributed physiology. And those concepts of distributed physiology, I think, are going to be relevant for every cell that's polarized and has complex architecture. At the level of function, it had been long uh, thought that these cells could not signal because they didn't have electrical signals. By looking at things very carefully near the membrane, we discovered that sparkling panorama of calcium signals. And by silencing it and activating it, we've shown that it is consequential for circuits and it is consequential for behavior. At the level of disease, along with other people in the field, including excellent colleagues in this room, 
we've shown that astrocytes do contribute to diseases, and they do so by losing their essential functions. And if you restore those essential functions, this is beneficial in Huntington's disease, and I would predict it would be beneficial in very many brain diseases. All of the things I've told you about, I think, are strongly supported by the papers from my lab, which I've cited. But I also want to emphasize, I have not said any of this on a whim. I've been thinking about and writing about and reading about these issues for nearly 20 years. And I'm thrilled that this work is finally gaining wider recognition. And I'm even more thrilled that this allows us to plan even better experiments. So for example, the neuronal doctrine is clearly correct. The brain clearly exists, consists of neurons which are all connected, and that's how the nervous system works. But those circuits and those neurons sit within a thick meshwork of connected astrocytes. And these astrocytes are absolutely essential for the normal functioning of those circuits. A challenge for which we don't yet have the answer is to identify behaviors, brain states, and physiological responses where the dynamic signaling of astrocytes to circuits is critical. And my guess is, based on the data that we have, these are going to be things such as fatigue, arousal, things that happen slowly, that involve large parts of the brain, where astrocytes that signal over large distances and over minutes or more may have a causal role. And that's something we need to study. And of course, the inner turmoil of the brain in the disease can only manifest itself to the outside world through the output of neurons. How else would it do it? The brain doesn't have a loudspeaker. But that doesn't mean that the underlying causes of those diseases have to be neuronal, and that doesn't mean that our strategies to fix those diseases have to be neuronal either. Work by us and many others in the field very clearly show that there are valid targets within astrocytes to target these diseases, and that's an area that we want to develop. So in finishing, I'm going to leave you with a thought, which is widely credited to Max Perutz, which says, what is known for certain is dull. And although the field started slowly, it's now rapidly growing. And this is a field where there are very many more unknowns than knowns. And it's a field that's certainly not dull. It's been a great privilege for me, along with my trainees, to have shepherded some of that growth, to have provided some of the answers, but more importantly, to have identified the new unknowns. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> we have time for some questions now. I'm going to invite Professor Tom O'Dell, uh, to, who's, going, who's kindly agreed to chair the question and answer session. Uh, Tom's a professor in physiology, himself leading a very excellent and vibrant group uh, studying mechanisms of learning and memory. So, Tom. Thank you, Val. Thank you for that, that really great talk. So, just to remind everyone, uh, this is being recorded, and so when you want to ask a question, raise your hand and we'll get a, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, so, any questions? Let me ask a question, Val. Um, you know, often when we think in biology, uh, it's evolution guides how we think of function uh, in cells, systems, organs. What about for glial cells? Like, are there, is there anything about the evolutionary biology of glial cells yeah, sort of that's emerging. informative about function? Yeah, so astrocytes probably evolved as soon as the earliest complex nervous systems evolved. And current estimates suggest about 600 million years ago. Um, I think that's roughly the Paleozoic era. And so there hasn't probably been a time during evolution where there was a need for a complex nervous system of multiple neurons where astrocytes didn't exist. Reactive astrocytes probably uh, came a bit later, but astrocytes existed. Microglia are relatively newer and have probably only been around for about 200 million years. But in early organisms that didn't have microglia, they had other cells that served those functions. Often those cells may have been astrocytes. And so my guess is that as soon as you needed to have lots of neurons packed into a small amount of space, and you needed compartmentalization to make sure that signaling one neuron didn't affect a neighboring neuron, or you can break that down even further, signaling in one part of the neuron, for example, a synapse, didn't affect the neighboring synapse, you needed a mechanism to biochemically isolate them, and those astrocytes evolved to fill those niches 
and allow that biochemical compartmentalization. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your lecture. Um, I have a question. Um, it seems like repairing brain function is complex as it is, but when you throw cancer into the mix, that makes it even more difficult to fix. Whether it's cancer metastasizing from another part of the body or whether it's brain cancer, how far along are you on research in terms of dealing with brain mets? Or obviously we're gonna to have to get rid of the cancer before you can restore brain function, but talk about brain mets if you can. What was the last word? You brain what? Brain met metastasize cancer metastasize oh, okay. uh, from see. other yeah. not not brain cancer but metastasize from another yeah. part of, to the well, brain. Well, it turns out that most brain tumors are actually tumors of the cells that I've been talking about. Most of them are gliomas or astrocytomas. So, an understanding of these cells in health and how they become metastatic is going to be critical. People are exploring that. It's certainly not an area that we've worked on. It's an area that's still growing, but there's an, an emergent field out there called cancer neuroscience. This has all happened in the last couple of years, a very exciting area of biology, <laughs> where now people are realizing that the presence of a tumor in the brain isn't just a growth that's pathological and damaging. The tumor itself can signal to neurons and to other cells and change the functions of those circuits. And so there's a field emerging of cancer neuroscience to understand how that happens. But also it goes the other way. Neuronal activity is thought to drive the proliferation and growth of tumors. And so this has all happened, not in my lab, but in other labs in the last few years. And I think you know, the future promises to answer some of those questions, but there aren't clear answers right now. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Rishon. Nope. That was a fantastic lecture, Bell, and congratulations on the science that led here. I want to ask the question about this remarkable specificity of the subcellular localization of these proteins, 200 some proteins in mm -hmm. one spot. Do you think that they are synthesized locally or they're transported there? And are there any tags then in these regions? And what yeah. happens to them if the regions change, for instance, if a blood vessel is replaced by mm -hmm. a synapse or something? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, that's a really insightful point. Uh, a few years ago, um, there was a talk by uh, a colleague from uh, WashU called Joe Doherty, and he gave a talk at a meeting and proposed that there was local protein synthesis in astrocytes. And I think Joe and I have discussed this often, and I think it's fair to say that I was fairly critical of that idea, but I think he's right. I mean, if you look at the proteins and how they're strongly co-localized, either the protein has to be made somewhere at distance, and once it's labeled, it robustly and reproducibly goes only to where it needs to be. Or in some compartments, it's genuinely made locally. And we don't have a definitive answer to this, but the profound blood vessel-like staining is very hard to explain unless those proteins were made locally, stored locally, and remained there, and that's how we can identify them. That's an idea that we've discussed in the lab, and I'd love it one day if we could really go after this and really nail it. In terms of synapses, those processes are very fine. And so it's possible in those cases, there isn't a machinery to make the protein locally. And in those cases, it may just be trafficking. But I think near blood vessels, where the end foot is actually quite large, has a sizable volume, my guess is that there, they're locally made. But that's something that you know, the field doesn't yet know that we need to nail. Uh, Jack. A spectacular work and a great talk, Paul. Congratulations. When the nervous system, for example, makes a movement, the timing on a millisecond basis is very critical. Yeah. Do you see these, these astrocytes and glia playing a critical role in the timing on a millisecond basis, or they're more involved in sort of supportive and slower actions? Yeah, I mean, this is a really important question. It's a question that the field has gone back and forth about probably two or three times. And early on, there, were, there was work by many other people in the field who argued and suggested that astrocytes were involved in the precise millisecond timescale domain of signaling to neurons. When we looked at this issue in some of the papers that I cited, we didn't find any evidence to support that. And so we, I think it's fair to say, were amongst the first to start saying, hold on a second, this probably doesn't happen in milliseconds or probably not even in hundreds of milliseconds.
Our data suggests things that astrocytes do probably evolve over tens of seconds, minutes or more. And so I don't think they're involved in fast things. I think they're involved in slow regulation. And in the context of slow brain states, diseases, those slow regulations I think are gonna be critical, but they may not be critical for ongoing um, um, fast signaling. The evidence for that, to my mind, is very clear. There is a knockout mouse that you can get rid of the vast majority of these fast signals, and the mouse is completely normal. And to my mind, that tells us that for normal ongoing physiology, the fast signaling probably isn't consequential, but it is consequential for the slow things. But that's still controversial. Some people still don't want to accept that, but my bet is that that's how it's gonna turn out. Uh-huh, right here. I'll get it, we need a microphone. Is there one here? Oh, you got it. Uh, hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. So my question is that you mentioned that Huntington's disease starts somewhat later in life. So why does it start immediately if the astrocytes already have this defective protein? And then do you know something that's happening to the astrocytes around the onset age of the symptoms that's different from when the patient was healthier? Yeah, so we have looked at um, the hu available human data and the mouse models at multiple ages. And when you get these aggregates within the cells, the mutant protein, mutant HTT, forms these aggregates. And one leading idea is that those aggregates are predisposing to subsequent pathology. When you begin to see those aggregates in the mouse models, that's when we begin to see astrocytes changing. Now, I think that doesn't rule out that there's an early developmental effect and indeed, there are many people out there who are studying this early developmental effects in Huntington's disease. I've been always been very wary of development because I find it quite scary to as, study things as they're developing. But nonetheless, I think that's a good question. And probably there is a role for early development in astrocytes. Certainly probably is a role for neurons. But so far, we've seen the greatest changes within astrocytes when you see those aggregations and those aggregations are thought to be one of the key pathological drivers. <clears throat> Hi, Bao. Uh, congratulations on the great talk. Uh, so in your, uh, the, the slide you showed, uh, there's a uh, astrocyte uh, uh, contact blood vessel to form this uh, end feed, and they're part of the blood-brain barrier. So in your analysis, uh, what's the percentage of astrocyte that contribute to the blood vessel contact, and uh, do they contribute to nutrition sur uh, support for neurons? So the answer to that question actually doesn't come from our, our analysis. The answer to that question comes from a really beautiful paper by Bruno Weber, um, which was published just six months ago. I tweeted about it, but, but I dare say nobody follows me. But, but, <laughs> but that paper showed that every astrocyte has at least one process that contacts a blood vessel. And on average, they have three, and they have up to, I think, seven or nine. So probably there isn't an astrocyte, or there's very rarely an astrocyte that doesn't contact the blood vessel. As I was looking through these images from Golgi and Kahal, they drew many of those contacting blood vessels. So I quickly did a calculation what the average is. Actually, 130 years ago, the average was about three. And so 140 years later, with in vivo two photon microscopy, they found the average was about three. So I think every astrocyte contacts them, and most of them contact it three times. So there probably isn't, an, isn't a large population of astrocytes that don't contact the vessels. And so the second question is, what do they do? So one idea is that the contacts with blood vessels regulate blood vessel diameter, and therefore regulate blood flow. And that's been a model sort of for functional hyperemia, that when there is excessive neuronal activation, you need to be able to provide more blood there to both deliver nutrients and take away waste products. And that's presumably a basis for functional imaging. And so that's been a leading mechanism that's been suggested. And my guess is that that's correct. There are details to work out. But my guess is that's what happens. The astrocytes are listening to ongoing neuronal activity. And when that neuronal activity exceeds a certain level, there needs to be an increase in you know, supply of blood. And then that changes blood vessel diameter. Now, whether it changes all blood vessels, because all blood vessels are not equal, you know, there are veins, there are arteries, there are capillaries, there are venules, that's still something that people are chewing over. 
And my own feeling of this is that it's probably the finest blood vessels whose caliber is being regulated and not the deep penetrating ones. And I think that's, we'll have to see how that shakes out. And so there is clear evidence that that would be useful to supply things to ongoing neural activity. Okay, we have time for one last question. Huh? A beautiful talk, Val, and not just see, because of the you? videos right here. Oh, hello. Um, so, so you presented a few, a few images related to how astrocytes relate to, to neurons. And one of those is the tripartite synapse, you know, the, the way that the neurons are expected to communicate one to each other. And, and you know, a couple of decades ago came up the astrocyte coming into, into, into that play, uh, into that game as an additional player. Then the other image that you presented was how they are interconnected by connecting 43 and perhaps several others. Now, how does that play with the tail that you're now coming to, uh, yeah. to bring that, that they are actually so different among different brain areas mm -hmm. and they, in even one, plays uh, probably different depending on the subcellular distribution of all the proteins and so on that, that have. Are, are then astrocytes passively witnessing what's happening at the synapse and then reacting to it? Mm -hmm. Or are they proactively playing on how that communication okay. goes? And then, or on top of that, are they behaving at those subcellular domains? Or are they, thanks to Connexin 43 and the many other that are perhaps yeah. making them possible to communicate each other, um, having broader domains of interaction and, and, and influence over the neuronal function, which then might bring you back to the Golgi, Ramon y Cajal controversy. I know, yeah, I was still, thinking about that too. Still exists. Yeah. I'm not gonna go there though. <laughs> you were okay. not So, so, but, but, but I, okay, so it's a good question. So if you look at astrocytes across the regions that we've examined, they clearly have region-specific properties. This happens at the level of morphology, it happens at the level of genes, and it happens at the level of protein, work we haven't yet published. But they also have very many shared features, and some of their shared features are things like their contacts and their coupling. So I think that's probably a general feature of them throughout the brain. And so they very much appear, at least in my assessment of the data so far, is that they're tuned to what the neurons want. And so they change their programs to suit the local environment. That's why I called it regional adaptation. But the things like the coupling that you mentioned, I think that's a shared feature. And probably the function of that is to supply nutrients across vast networks, is probably to, su to siphon off potassium. People have shown that if you look at fluorescent derivatives of glucose, you can see glucose being trafficked across large networks of astrocytes to different distant regions of the brain. So my guess is that's what those networks do. Now, your question about the tripartite synapse, right? So I'm gonna say something which I might regret. Okay, so I think this notion of the tripartite synapse, um, if you think about it, there really isn't a need to say that word. Nobody's ever had the necessity to call synapses bipartite. We've just called them synapses. I think when Sherrington came up with this definition, it was from the Greek of coming together. And I think the Greek of coming together for the word synapse is sufficient to explain not only synapses as we see them as pre and post, but is also sufficient to explain multiple elements coming together, either from astrocytes or from microglia. So I've gone off the word tripartite. I don't think it has a focus meaning, and I think it conveys more confusion than it does clarity. And some of that confusion is rooted in the experiments. And those experiments, as Jack was asking, have, have argued that synapses and astrocytes communicate on the millisecond timescale, and that's why they need to be there. And the evidence to support that, I think, is now decreasing, and that idea, although very valuable and important to move the field forward, is now falling out of favor. Those processes need to be there because there are other things that they do. There are other things that they supply during development to allow synapses to form. There are probably structural elements that they need to do, and like I mentioned to uh, Tom's earlier question, I think a key reason you need those things at synapses is just you want to limit the diffusion of neurotransmitters out from the synapse that you want to signal to. The dendritic spine is biochemical compartmentalization in a spine. 
for a dendritic spine to have biochemical compartmentalization, you need to have extracellular compartmentalization to stop the signal from spreading. And my guess is that that's exactly what those processes are doing, and you don't need to invoke an active millisecond role to show their importance. But that's something that we need to chase down and something that we need to either prove or refute. Professor, we actually have one last question here. Okay. okay. I really appreciate your time and sharing um, everything. And I just have two quick questions. One is, um, you mentioned OCD. I'm not sure if like ADHD and um, autism would also be part of your research. And then two is, as an aspiring MD-PhD, um, I'm just curious, um, because coming from an industry background, I worked in finance and consulting for the past six, seven years. Um, I have a very short time span to kind of narrow down what I want to do for my research for the next 20 to hopefully like forever, uh, however long I live. But I'm just curious like how you got started, how you picked like your passion and how you stick to it for the past 20 years. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think the question about OCD, I think, to be fair, we haven't done anything, any ever worked on autism, so I'm not gonna comment on things that I know nothing about. We have worked quite extensively on OCD-related behaviors. The paper that I mentioned, Soto et al, came out last week online. There's an elaborate story in there which I didn't have time to discuss. And the basic take-home message of that paper is that in OCD, you know, there's the obsession component of OCD, the thinking about something, right? That's the obsession. Then there's the compulsion component where you carry out a repetitive action. In the human realm, you might think of it as excessive washing of hands, the cleaning of door handles. And then there's an anxiety component because often in OCD, patients know that there isn't some immediate danger if they don't do this compulsion, but if they don't perform it, they get great anxiety and the anxiety drives the obsession and the compulsion. So in that paper that, we meant, that I mentioned, we managed to begin to dissect this. Of course, studying obsessions in mice is very difficult, so I've got nothing intelligent to say about that. But we have managed to dissect the anxiety component and the compulsion component. And the anxiety component, our data suggests so far, is predominantly neuronal. And the compulsion component has a very significant contribution for mastocytes. So we're beginning to tease that apart. We haven't done anything on ADHD and we haven't done anything meaningful on autism. Now, your second question about, was about what you should do for the rest of your career. I mean, I would suggest you should come and work in my lab. And um, now, the third question was how we got into this sort of business. And I think I don't have an answer that's gonna be applicable to anybody in this room, but I think it's important um, to do things that you enjoy and I think it's important to do things that you think you can do well. And, and I think from early on, I enjoyed tinkering about in the lab, messing around in the lab. And it's also an area that it's a safe environment. You can be left alone and do whatever you want and nobody really cares. And I think that's an important thing to do. We shouldn't underestimate the value of leaving people alone to get on with their work. And I think if there are scientists out there, they'll understand exactly what this means. And for young people like yourself, I mean, I don't have any real advice to give you other than do what you enjoy and do what you can do well. But recognize that often you need focused thought for long periods of time. And it's great to be in an environment where you can be left alone to do that. Okay, I think that's it. Yes. <laughs>